The Lonely Trail by Paul Finch. Read by Leslie Grantham. She was a forlorn figure, Albert thought, as the train pulled slowly out of Euston. He'd settled down about ten seats behind her and dug a crumpled copy of the sun out of his Mac pocket to while away the trip. But he couldn't keep his eyes off the woman, even though all she was doing was sitting there, gazing out of the window. She surely couldn't see much through those opaque sunglasses. He watched her carefully. After a moment, she loosened her coat and pulled back a crimson cowl, shaking free a mass of ginger locks. Nice. He wondered what she was like from the front. He still not had a proper look at her. Only from behind, the prerogative of a private investigator, he supposed. She was trim, though, with an elegant shape, and walked smartly on black high heels. Her fur overcoat came down to the back of her knees, showing sturdy calves beneath, sheathed in nylon with straight seams. It wasn't the first erotic fix he'd had in the pursuit of unfaithful wives. The clothing they wore to meet their lovers in sometimes astounded even him. The spots chosen for the illicit liaisons were often more daring than safe. He'd lost count of the number of times he'd crept up, camera in hand, on cars parked in open woodland, on back alleys behind nightclubs, even on bus shelters and secluded beaches. It was certainly more fun than tracking burglars and bank robbers. Not as much bread mind. He'd made quite a lot of that in his last few years in the Met. Quite a lot. So much, in fact, that they'd finally looked into it. And so, here he was minus pension in a second-class railway carriage on the trail of another dirty weekend. He tried to get into the sun, but the woman kept distracting him. She was leaning her head against the side, panelling with a weary, languid air. The window beside her was streaming with February rain, the land beyond it a rolling, dismal tableau of houses, fields, roads and factories. He wasn't entirely sure where she was travelling to, so he'd been forced to buy a ticket all the way. Carlisle, in fact. But she seemed to be travelling light, only a handbag strung over one shoulder. It was a more mysterious job than usual. Albert had received a generous bundle of notes through the post, with no cover letter, and then a phone call from a whispery voiced man who simply said that he wanted his wife following. He suspected that she was up to something and wanted to know exactly what. If Albert found out, there'd be treble that amount of cash waiting on his front doormat the morning after he got back. There'd been no address given, no name, not even a photograph of the target. If he got to Euston for 9am on Friday, he'd been told, he'd see her by gate 15. He couldn't miss her. The voice had then gone on to describe the fur overcoat, the cowl scarf of crimson wool, the black patent shoes, even the seamed stockings. It hadn't got a detail wrong. She'd be well covered, it had had it. The cowl would be pulled up and she'd probably have dark glasses on. The bitch never took the risk of being recognised. Albert understood that. He'd once followed a woman for a whole fortnight who went to a secret tryst dressed as a Carmelite nun. The private eye made several trips back and forth along the train to the toilets and the buffet, but the woman never strayed from her seat. The train passed through Birmingham, Crewe and Wigan, and still she leaned against the window gazing out. Occasionally she would rearrange her posture and huddle into her coat as if a sudden chill had gone past her. Then at Lancaster she abruptly stood up, pulled her cowl up, replaced her sunglasses and moved to the doors. Albert was almost taken by surprise. He spilled coffee all over his raincoat in his haste to put it on and follow her. He knew that he couldn't afford to let her get out of his sight. Occasionally, even if the quarry didn't suspect they were being followed, they'd take some bizarre circumnavigatory route, just to throw off any imaginary bloodhounds. She walked casually out through the ticket hall, Albert never far behind, but exercising care not to crowd her. You could never afford to get too close. If this woman had any inkling that he was there, however, she hadn't shown it yet. She hadn't looked behind her once, all the way from London. It was now midday and the northern sky a power wash of rain clouds. An icy wind was blowing and Albert wished he'd put something warmer on. He watched across the station concourse towards a taxi rank and slowly tensed. This was always the difficult part. Contrary to popular belief, jumping into a taxi and saying, follow that cab, would rarely ensure that you didn't lose someone. It wasn't that the cabbies weren't willing. Most of them were more enthusiastic than you were. But without police driver training, it was virtually impossible to stay in touch, especially in heavy traffic. One stubborn set of lights, one busy roundabout could be enough to spoil the whole job. To Albert's surprise, however, 
The woman didn't take a taxi, but passed them by and walked off the concourse, following signposts to the town centre. Bemused, he went after her. He'd only been on this case for one morning, yet already he covered more ground than he usually did in the month back in London. He hoped his mysterious employer would be as generous with the expenses as he was with wages. He kept a careful 50 yards or so behind her, now wary that any second she could stop to look in a shop window or turn to cross the road. She never did, however, but continued straight on, head down against the sodden wind. Even in this weather, the university town was lively and bustling, but the woman still cut a solitary figure. So far, it had been one lonely trail, Albert reflected, for the both of them. Five minutes later, she entered the information office in the town's central bus station. Albert stopped on the corner, watching tentatively. She was only out of sight for perhaps a minute and re-emerged with an information leaflet, which she glanced quickly through as she crossed the various bays and slip roads. Albert had to move sharply to keep up. He just had time to see her climbing into a big double-decker. The driver was on the verge of settling down in front of the wheel. Albert ran. He made it a split second before the doors hissed shut behind him. The unmistakable legs and heels were disappearing upstairs. Albert glanced up after her and mopped a trickle of sweat from his brow. Yeah? Somebody asked. He turned and saw the driver staring curiously at him. He was a heavy, middle-aged man with a hard, thin mouth. Where to, mate? Oh, um, Albert was suddenly lost for words. As far as you go, please. Uh, where's the terminus? Morecambe Bay, said the driver with a sudden look of suspicion. He had noticed Albert's cockney lilt and now his appearance as well. A shabby raincoat, a mop of greaseback grey hair, unshaven cheeks and a gold stud in one ear was never likely to commend you to the hard-nosed northerner. Albert tried to play it down, smiling and shrugging, as if he travelled Britain's buses without ever really knowing where he was going for a hobby. And he forked out the requisite cash. Then he sat down to wait. There was no need to go upstairs. That was pushing his luck perhaps too much. And in any case, the woman couldn't leave the bus without him seeing her. Minutes passed as the double-decker rolled out through drab, rain-swept fields. The sky ahead was that vast, awesome expanse of nothing so common on the coast in winter full of Atlantic squalls. Morecambe, Albert thought with some consternation. What a place to carry on an affair in. He was a South London boy, born and bred. He had a positive need for the hub and throng of the city. He didn't know the place, but to him, Morecambe, like so many bleak seaside towns, was just another crumbling Victorian edifice, filled with people who were counting the days to their ultimate retirement. The sooner he got this job over and done with, the better. They reached the resort in less than half an hour and came to halt on the promenade, where the woman finally disembarked. Albert watched for a second, then rolled his paper up and followed. She was only about 30 yards ahead of him, walking southwards past the numerous boarded-up candy floss stalls and closed ticket offices. On his right, the famous sands rolled off to a distant horizon, where the white sea frothed and burst and swarmed with off-season gulls diving for herring. The air was filled with rain, but also sour with salt. They walked for minutes along the empty parade, the private eye acutely aware of how exposed and conspicuous he was. He also began to wonder if the woman knew he was there. Her failure to look behind her even once was now more like a stubborn refusal, a determination not to take any precautions, as if she couldn't care less. Then she turned sharply right and went down a flight of steps to the beach. Albert moved to the barrier and stared after her, totally confused. She was hardly dressed for it, but she struck out nevertheless, high heels, stockings and all, plodding over the damp, rich sand towards the distant waterline. The feeling that she was aware of him suddenly became a conviction. Albert trotted down the steps after her. She was walking quickly and had gained some ground on him, so he had to hurry to keep up. He'd only been on the beach for a few minutes before he was plunging to the shoelaces in ice-cold seawater, or sliding and sinking on a shifting surface. Albert glanced behind him, Already the concrete promenade and row of drab shop fronts behind it seemed miles away. The wind was whipping his coat and pelting him with rain. He looked back to the woman, now a distant figure in black, moving steadily southwest towards a jutting headland of sand dunes. Almost immediately the truth struck him. She was meeting no lover. Nothing of the sort, in fact. He'd heard how treacherous the sands of Morecambe Bay could be, how terrifying the tides. God forbid she was going to go and do something crazy. Albert began to run. He didn't really care about the woman. He didn't know her after all. 
but he'd been following her all day and somebody was bound to have noticed, the bus driver for one. A moment later, however, she vanished from sight. Albert was now slogging through sand, so waterlogged it was more like sludge. The freezing wind was lashing him. It took him several minutes to make it to the dunes, where her trail snaked off through higher, drier sand and tussocks of spiky grass. It led over a steep brow, then down through a shallow gully to flat ground again. The sea was waiting there. A high tide was due and cold grey waves were already flowing far inland, breaking in front of him in wide ripples. Albert came down to the water's edge breathless, and perhaps 40 yards to his left saw the woman standing staring out over it. He approached her tentatively. She'd taken off her cowl and sunglasses and her bronzed hair was tossing wildly in the stiff breeze. She was rigid as a bald and made no indication that she knew he was there. As he closed in, however, the wind suddenly dropped and a handsome, flawless profile was presented to him. The petite chin tilted bravely upwards. Albert's jaw dropped. He saw the woman only from her right-hand side, but he'd have recognised her anywhere. How could he not have done? Christ almighty, he stammered. Angela. He stumbled disbelievingly towards her. At first, the flaxen blonde, who was now a garish, phony redhead, made no move. Then slowly she turned and looked directly at him. He stopped in his tracks, a cry of anguish locked in his throat. The full horror of it lasted only a second, however, before he realised that men were coming down from the sand dunes behind him. He didn't need to see them to know what they'd be like. Massive, hard-faced, dressed in casual but expensive suits. Thick gold rings on every finger. I'm sorry, Albert, she said after a second. As you can see, I had no choice. And then the men were on him, hacking bone-hard punches into his ribs. Are you serious? One of them hissed savagely into his ear. He repay Mr. Southern's generosity by falling around with his bit of carpet. Another man stood beside Angela, nonchalantly offering her a cigarette. She took it, but continued to watch, shivering as the rest of them hoisted up Albert's struggling, kicking body and carried it away towards the quicksand. A succession of tears made a single lonely trail down her right-hand cheek. <laughs> 